Oh, I've been looking for one of these for a while now. It's a TI-84 Plus CE with Python. Oh, that's quite the mouthful. Standard color Texas Instruments calculator, but it's got Python. That's not why I find it interesting. The reason I find it interesting is because the rumor is the way it implemented Python is really janky. But I haven't seen anyone online do a video looking inside to see if it's true, the, the stories. So <laughs> the rumor is this thing uses a coprocessor, a, uh, an ARM chip, and the ARM chip is running, I believe, CircuitPython, which is the Adafruit version of Python meant for like microcontroller and embedded devices. And <laughs> apparently, this thing still has the same CPU, which is a uh, modern Z80 acclaim. I guess they still make Z80s. Not only do they make Z80s, they make newer versions of the Z80. It's pretty crazy. Great, let's program in Python. Oh, here we go. Python app. What the heck is it doing? Who knows? Okay, looks like we've got the, the three dashes, which is the, what is it called, REPL? That's what they, what was it called, like, read, evaluate, print, line, I don't know. Oh, okay, here's the actual code itself on the Python code. Oh, shoot, how do we get it? Oh, escape, okay. Files, line regurgitator. Oh, I see, so if I hit edit, all right, there we go. Okay, so it has it has um, Python functions. See, I was importing TI plot library as plot. All right, so then there should be a function, or there should be the plt command down here someplace. Oh, there we go. Yep, that that's a straight line, pretty much. Well, that's all well and good. Let's take a look inside. Let's turn this thing off. Keyboard interrupt. How do I get out of Python mode? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> stay a while, stay forever. It seems like this would be a lot more handy if you had like an external keyboard hooked up, which you can do if you get an adapter. I believe I actually have some. We could try that. Because imagine like trying to type all those things. A one hundred and thirty dollar calculator, while still overpriced, has a removable battery, but your one thousand dollar cell phone doesn't. Oh, that's new. Oh, there must be a charging dock they make for this thing. All right, so place your bets in the comment section below. Are the rumors true? Will there be a coprocessor? How about I just didn't spend like $130 for nothing? Because if there's a coprocessor, this will be very interesting to do experiments on. Do you think my son would actually be stupid enough to bring the diary back here? Oh no, plastic tabs. Lame. Did we get the riddle of the Sphinx? Well, I see the main CPU. I don't see a sub-CPU yet. I don't know, have, have I been led ashtray? Oh my gosh, it's true! All right, so here you have your main CPU, which is still an 8-bit descendant of the Z80 running all that legacy software. And then this little guy right here, that is an ATSAM D21E18 a dash U. Oh my gosh. So that's going to be actually, we use something very similar to that in our pinball machines. So that's going to be a ARM Cortex M0 uh, 32 bit, 48 megahertz. And as you can see, this one doesn't have very many pins because they're not using it for the IO. They're just using it so they can run what I, I believe is CircuitPython. But man, an 18U. So that would be. 32K of RAM, and I want to say a hundred and no, it's no, it's 32K of RAM and 256K of flash. And I guess I'll put the real numbers on the screen and see how close I got. Yeah, um, so this they're probably not using this for USB. That's probably handled. So yeah, this is a this is a Z80 acclaim. So it actually is a Z80 compatible co core, so they can use all their old code from like 30 years ago. But then it has access to modern peripherals such as Spy, I squared C, um, also USB. 
what I'm guessing they're doing, <laughs> I, I'm going to dig in here and try to figure it out, but I think they're probably doing like, they're probably sending like um, Python command lines over to this via spy and then it's sending the responses back. It could also be formatting the responses into like TI basic or something that the main CPU could could run because apparently the performance of this is pretty bad. I don't know enough about Python to, to um, you know, qualify that, but it would seem like it'd be bad because it's an interpreted language. It's running on a really dinky. This is probably like the bottom of the barrel microcontroller that could even run Python. And then it's swapping the data with this. So it's kind of almost like having a coprocessor. Well, actually, it is exactly like having a coprocessor. This is such a pin reduced version of the chip. We should be able to figure out what spy lines it's using. I would think they'd be using spy. That would be the most logical. Now this is bizarre. They added screws to the back, which makes it more serviceable than the previous TI-84 CE Plus model. But then these uh, plastic rivets that were holding the shielding in place are also holding the PCB in place. What I really want, I want to find test points for the spy bus. Oh, then we can really watch the magic happen using an oscilloscope. See, I think if you got something like the NumWorks calculator, which is kind of like an open source, I think they kickstarted it. It's like an open source from scratch graphing calculator. It has Python as well, but I bet it's the entire calculator is like a 32-bit ARM implementation. Also, check this chip on DigiKey. All goose eggs. So Texas Instruments, they're the ones buying these up. This chip isn't even made by them. This particular chip is made by Atmel. The Texas Instruments calculators almost never have any Texas Instruments parts whatsoever. What the heck? Huh? Why is there captain tape over that? What? Wait, would that button not function? What the heck is going on? Look at that. What is that, the th number three? Okay, beep, beep, back up the bus. I have to come to a screeching halt and see if that three key actually works. What? Why would they put tape over it? It was an act of sabotage! Dwight, we've been robbed. No, Michael, you've been sabotaged. Right, the three key works. Well, then what's with the captain tape? Why would they do that? So long ago, so long apart, she couldn't wait another day for the captain of her tape. I wonder if this thing will go with just a USB port in it. Uh, ah, yes, USB mini. Good on you, Texas Instruments. Everyone knows USB mini is the superior format. This is odd, when I put it back into Python mode, the example files are gone. I'm gonna see if I can bypass the battery by applying 3.8 volts to the terminal. All right, that worked. So before I execute Python, there are some test points over here which are somewhat near that chip. I'm gonna see if anything changes. <clears throat> Excuse me. That line was low and it went high once I started Python. What happens if I quit Python? Oh, I hit the wrong button. Yes, I'm sure. Are you sure you don't want an extended warranty for your vehicle? Oh, man, I cannot believe how much junk mail buying a car generated. Yeah, now that's low. Interesting. What about these other three pins? Could those be serial data? Oh, oh, I actually saw something there. Oh, interesting. Let's get this on the scope. I will use this Q-tips package to hold the camera in front of the scope. All right, I have the Python uh, shell open here. And I'm gonna hit this tab and press the five key. All right, you see that? Something's happening. So let's go to trigger. We're gonna go falling slope, blah, blah, blah. All right, so I'm gonna hold on that pin and I'm gonna hit single. I was going to wait for the next event, which is coming now. There we go. What is that? A pitiful little pile of data. <gasps> Look, it's some data. It must be spying over the 
Oh, well, I don't. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna look it up right now. I'm just gonna look it up right now. I know what the acronym is. I don't know what it stands for. REPL. Unlike SCUBA, I know what that stands for. Read, evaluate, print loop. This would have bi-directional communications. So another one of these, so th that's the data line, then another one of these should be the clock line. Oh, okay, so so far we found an active high and a data. Of course, is that data coming or going? That's another good question. Actually, we saw what five looked like. Let's see what two looks like. Okay, so let's do single. And actually, I'm going to do zero. Okay. I wonder if that's an, I bet that's an ASCII representation. I wouldn't be surprised. Although we don't have framing, so it's hard to. All right, see how you got mostly low, some high, mostly low. Look at 48, which is ASCII for zero. In binary, it looks like an inverse of that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See what I'm getting at? So this would be an LSB, least significant bit, first ASCII representation of the character being transmitted between microprocessors. Here's the number two, so it would be 48 plus two. So we still have the two ones here, but we've added the two there. Now, oh. <laughs> can you spot anything? Can you see what I see? Can you see what I see? There's two gaps here when you only need one, which means this could be just regular cereal. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be? Uh, well, actually, there's a way to figure it out. Yeah, so we got, um, yeah, we just need an odd number. So we would need 49, which would be the number one. Let's try it out. And there it is, 49 in, what is this, is this just UART? Oh, are they just doing like a UART REPL command line interface? A REPL CLE? A REPL CLE. That sounds vaguely sexual. Let me, uh, let me dial in the bus and see if it'll pick it up. Oh, there it is right there. 56, well, basically 57.6 kilohertz. Oh, it is actually 115200 because if we're looking at the frequency of this, we're looking at the rate of change. So it goes, it goes down, then it goes up. But we're actually going twice that speed because we're caring about each edge, right? So see, if, if you think about this as a frequency, like how it said, you know, 57, so you've got um, that falling edge to that falling edge. So this and this both go into one cycle, creating 57 kilohertz. However, since it's a zero bit, then a one bit, then a zero bit, the actual data rate is twice that. Which means if we hit the bus display and go ASCII, there we go, the, no, the ASCII character one. I almost said the numeral one, but that's technically not correct. So this thing is sending RS-232-115-200 serial back and forth between the processors. Jank mustank. So I wonder if this other pin that I didn't think does anything. Okay, that one's high. So this one might be the, um, if that's transmit, this might be receive. So this would be the ARM chip sending data back to the other chip. So I'm gonna hit enter and see if that happens. Oh, it was that other line. The one that I noticed went from low to high. I believe that is the return serial line. So, well, yeah, here's how, what we can do. I'm going to type in 001122. 001122, that's just gibberish. Now I'm going to hit, I'm going to back out a bit. I'm going to hit single. And I'm going to send this. And it should just return back what I sent. Wait a minute, I sent over 001122 and then I hit enter, but it truncated off 00, I guess because it's redundant, so it'd be 1122 as an integer. So that's why I only sent back four characters. But why is it... Oh, well, you know what I should do? I should just hook up some test points to this, and then I could have both channels running. I could look at both of them on the scope. I've added these two test wires. So the blue one, the upper one, that is receive going into the sub coprocessor <laughs> the sub coprocessor that's kind of redundant and the white one is the data coming back from the coprocessor this implementation is even more jank than i expected all right so both of the serial lines are low 
until I go into Python mode, and then they both snap to attention. So yeah, it's 3.3 .3 volts. That's what you'd expect. All right, um, let's try to capture something. Five. Oh, I need to go into the shell. Five. Oh, looks like I got it backwards. Um, yeah, see how... Uh, all right, yeah, so the one that I thought was um, sending back, that was actually transmitting. So this is the Z80 Acclaim, the main CPU, sending the five, and then this is the ARM sending it back. So they've got code running on the, the main calculator, which is basically running like a terminal. Just like if you terminaled into uh, Python using uh, uh, Putty or what's that other program they have? I'm just going to hit enter with nothing else. Hmm. Oh, look, look, look. See that? There, there's your REPL, the three uh, symbols that you get. And what's uh, what's that dot? Was it also sending back? Oh, was it sending a carriage return? Is that what this is? Oh, <laughs> well, what what did I send over? Maybe this is some sort of secret op code. Let's take a look. Let's uh, let's get out of ASCII mode. Let's go into uh, hex. Okay. Um, 20 is space. This is hex. O-D-O-A, I'm pretty sure that's a carriage, carriage return line feed. Let me double check. That's correct. So it's, it's basically just sending back terminal data. <laughs> wow. Again, this is what the ARM chip is sending back. This other one, 1B5B46OD. So OD is a carriage return. So they're probably using that as the terminator. The other ones are probably just acting as, um, well, actually, let me try it. Let me try something. Let's back out. Let's go into single mode. I'm going to type five and hit enter. All right, let's see what we got. Compute, darn you. Okay, so we got carriage return, new line. Oh, maybe there's something, something happened further down the road. Oh, what's, oh yeah, what's this, 06? 06, what would that be? Like, tab, bell? These things are like miles apart, look at this. <laughs> You've gone a million miles, how far'd you get? That land where you don't remember, and you can't forget. Oh, I bet me typing the F was a separate a separate thing. So let's back out. I'm just going to type. I'm sorry, me typing it. Let's hit the five. OK, yeah. So there's me pressing the five key. So then me pressing five enter would be two different events. OK. Oh, and then enter. OK, so enter must be sending its own string command. Oh, that's probably why. OK, actually, let's let's run it again. Let's grab enter. Pew. So remember, well, I pushed five. It took the five. And then I pushed uh, enter, and then enter generated this this keystroke here. So I'm guessing the first thing is a non-printable character. I think we already saw this. 1B. Okay, well, let me check what 1B is on my ASCII chart. Because why wouldn't I have a laser-cut plastic ASCII chart in my basement? Right? 1B is escape. Oh, it's, it's an escape sequence. Right? Like uh, like, uh, like a terminal, right? Like a VT100. Oh my gosh, this is so jank. Wait, is that is that the escape sequence for pressing enter on a terminal? Oh, we should look this up. An escape code, it looks like. 1B, 5B, 4, 6, OD. Then we send that, and the first thing this sends back is a carriage return, the ARM chip, I mean. Then if we go into the future here, one minute into the future, Let's go into ASCII. Five and some characters, and then it returns the uh, j -j 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 and then 
space, 2, 0, which is 32. Oh, but there's more. If we go, oh, oh my gosh, this is so slow. If we go, oh my, no. How far in the future is that? That's like 30 milliseconds into the future. Get, all right, I'm gonna go 30 milliseconds into the future. And let's just call it, let's call it the calculator and the arm, okay? The prince and the pauper, the princess and the pea, the agony and the ecstasy, the fast and the furious. Look what it sends back. 30 milliseconds later, 06, ASCII acknowledge. I have a search on Wikipedia. My best guess for this escape sequence. So it's escape, left bracket, F, and then carriage return. The closest thing that matches is an X term sequence. Escape, left bracket, uppercase F, and that means end, which I guess kind of makes sense for inputting something, but then they've appended a carriage return onto it. The reason that's important is because if I were to try to sniff this and try to inject uh, data from a separate terminal and also receive it, I would have to have the correct escape sequence attached to my enter key in order for it to work. Uh, maybe Putty could do it? I'm not sure. I know Putty has options for changing what the backspace key does, but I don't know about enter. I'm gonna do a test. I've wired the line that comes from the main CPU into the receive pin of an FTDI cable. I'm gonna see if that'll allow me to see the data over Putty on my computer. Yeah, it turned out the diode was unnecessary, but yeah, look at that. 25 times five. There it is over there, hit enter. Boo! Okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is printing back what's coming from the ARM chip. So now I'm gonna attach the transmit line of FTDI and see if I can hijack that line which should then allow me to send commands from PuTTY, although I might have to use an escape sequence to actually execute the enter command. And press program on the calculator, Python app. Okay, shell reinitialized. Now I'm gonna hit shell on the calculator. All right, five times five. Now let's see if it works over here. Five times five. No, this part isn't working. Receive line on the FTDI has a pull up on it. So even if that, nothing's connected, it's 3.3 volts. Transmit line is the same way. I'm surprised it's not going low, although maybe the other two devices are causing it to stay high. I just did a few more checks. So yes, this FTDI is not able to pull down the transmit line on the calculator itself, which means I can only read what it's uh, saying. So I want it so that the FTDI cable or the keypad on the calculator can send commands to the little, ch the extra chip. I'm thinking maybe an AND gate would do it. So there's our AND gate. So let's call this ARM. So technically that's the ARM's receive pin. Okay, so Let's call it Z80TX and then FTDITX. So if it's an AND gate, so the signal is active high. So if both of the lines are active high, or if both the lines are high, then a one comes out. If either one of them is low, then that output goes out, which that would be a good way of combining them. But we also have to assume the FTDI cable is not always in place. So the other input would go to a switch, like a three-way switch. Well, I'm sorry, a two-way switch. And one of the ways would go to the FTDI, the other one would go to VCC. So if it's an FTDI mode, it's controlled by that. If it's in VCC mode, it always sends a one. The only possible th issue I can think of is those lines go low when it's not in use. I don't know if that's used to wake up the arm, if that does something weird. They're not always active. It's only when you go into Python mode that they turn on. You know, we can just try it and see what happens. Well, yeah, so one, one equals one. And then if either one of them equal zero, then this equals zero. 
which means either one of these sources could start the <clears throat> start the RS232 uh, start bit pulse. Because as we first saw on the on the scope, the first bit is just the start bit because you don't know if the LSB is going to be a one or a zero, so that's why you always have to start with a zero so that you see a, a falling edge from the high signal. Okay, so to do this, I need to find the line, cut it, and then add an AND chip, grab power. That shouldn't be a big deal. You can probably find power on that EEPROM right there. And then add an FTDI header port and a switch. <laughs> why am I doing this? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Seems like a direct connection. Wow, two test points? Wow, so luxurious. Much luxury. Such um such how does that go with that dog thinks? Much luxury, such opulence. Wow. Yeah, so these vias come from the main ship. And then this one takes goes around the horn because I'm sure this is only a two-sided board to save money. Yeah, I could cut the trace here and then see if it stops it from working and then I know that it works. One simple trick to ruin your calculator's Python functions. Doctors hate him. You know, they probably should have called this cable a, a, a SIF, some insertion force. Oh no, my keys. I forgot to tape it. Let there be no light. Oh no, Python is broken. Well, I guess that's what we wanted. Okay, I can see a big Beefosaurus Rex power rail snaking its way through there over to the EEPROM. So that's gonna be ground and VCC. So yeah, let's just, uh, let's just snap it in the breeze. I'm sure there's plenty of room to fit this. Oh look, it's the do not steal tag. Oh, now I can steal it. I can sell it to the Foot Clan. Down, 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 down. Bad timing, lady. Hmm, it still has power, even when it's turned off. All right, so I've added another jumper wire. So it's CPU side, arm side. I was in the sewers, trying to survive, when I came across quite the sight. Four baby turtles. I gathered them up in an old coffee can and then gave them names. Death comes for us all, Orokusaki. Ugh, I just had another bowel movement. But for you, something far worse. For when you die, it will be without honor. Oops! Ah, <laughs> oh, such a great movie. If you've ever wondered why I charge so much for my single-handed controllers, it's because each one of those mods requires quite a few little tiny soldering junctions just like this. All right, I'm gonna try this from memory. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> on the half shell, they're the Heroes 4. In this day and age, who could ask for more? The crime wave is high with muggings mysterious, all police and detectives, as if those are two different things, are furious because they can't find the source of this leafly evil force. Uh, I'm a witness, so give me a quarter. Call me a reporter. Uh, April O'Neil in on this case. That's all I remember. <laughs> oh, and then that song they said Raphael is the leader of the group. Um, I don't think Raphael is the leader of the group. I mean, he certainly had the most uh, character development. Of the turtles and by the most I mean any you know he lost a sigh and all the output of the AND gate is going to go to the arm chip and one of the inputs is going to be from the main CPU and the other one is either going to be from 5 up uh, 3.3 volts or the FTDI cable oh crap I hooked up the output to the ground pin uh, I did not heed the words of master splinter on that one the test points aren't labeled but at least they're there Let's do a sanity check. I'm going to attach this wire to 3.3 uh, volts, and that should restore the functions. If that works, we can proceed with attaching our other ports, or whatever it is we're going to do. 
Yeehaw! Texas Instruments! The best company in the country of Texas! Don't you mean the state of Texas? You heard what I said. RTFM. This particular surface mount chip, it's switched around. Normally, on an AND gate, it's input, input, output, input, input, output. This one is input, input, output. <sighs> So of course this wire, which is already too short. Let's try it again, Sam. All right, now it works. Let's continue. Okay, I'm just being very cautious here. I'm just doing another test. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. There it is. Now what happens when I hit enter? Oh, I guess it just worked. So I guess the that escape sequence I saw coming from the T, I I guess doesn't really mean anything. Let's see if this works. It worked! <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, well, I'm gonna continue adding this port. I gotta say though, I think if you're an educator and you want kids to get into Python, a Raspberry Pi Pico, the 2040 chip, is a much better and cheaper way of doing it. I just thought of a great joke. Why did the capacitor get sent to bed without supper? Because he threw a temper tantalum. Okay, so overview. I cut the um, transmit trace from the main CPU to the sub CPU over here. And then I've got it going into an AND gate. So um, if either this input or this input goes low, it pulls the output low that's going into the, the Python chip thus initiating a serial data transfer. Then this switch up here selects basically whether or not if you got the plug in. I could have been fancy and added some sort of switch to make it automatic, but I'm not feeling that fancy. I don't want to add an unnecessary number of integrated circuits. Yeah, so let's do one more check. So let's see if the, is this is that way. Okay, so that should be without the plug. So we'll make sure that works. Then we'll make sure the switch works with the plug and then we'll seal it up. Okay, doing a test program, Python app, execute, blah, 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 blah. Shell five. Okay, great, that's working. All right, let's try it again. Okay, Python app, enter. Okay, shell five, great. Now if we flip this, it should hot swap into it. So this still works. I'm gonna try typing six on my computer. Great, it works. Let's seal the deal. Ah, a plastic carving job that could be best described as passable. I was just gonna say, oh, it seems to work even with the switch in the other position, but no, we got a bunch of extraneous data there. Five times five is 25. Six times six, pick up bricks. Uh, rhymes. Why does Disney keep remaking Hamlet in Africa? <sighs> They've done it like three times. Lion King, Black Panther, Lion King. Oh man, I gotta do a late night Python session here. It's a good thing I've got my, my whole workflow set up. Now I can really get some work done. Hello world, exclamation point. Hey man, it worked. Actually, this is this is kind of cool, <laughs> I have to admit. I mean, the calculator's super janky way of implementing Python made this possible. That's interesting, the calculator processed it, but it didn't do anything with it. Oh, Python's still, oh, of course, yeah, Python's still running, it's still running on the sub CPU. I'm gonna call this program my name. Oh, this only works when you're in shell mode because, oh yeah, you'd create the program and then you'd send it over. So let's try this. I'll have to do it with the, with the calculator. Okay, so if we have the file name Ben and then we run it, then it comes over the serial port. I think there probably is another communication layer, likely uh, a spy bus. I just wasn't able to pin it out. Although there's really no need to. I mean, I think this part's pretty cool itself. Because if you think about it, like if you go into editor and okay, so we're editing the program, Ben, and anything we do here uh, doesn't actually get sent over. Oops, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that and delete. 
But what's interesting is if I'm over here, if I type uh, five times five, oh wait, no, I lost it. Never mind. Oh, I forgot to flip the switch. <laughs> Oops. Push the button, Frank. Okay, so five times, no, five times five. Five, eight, five? Yeah, watch this. So if I go into editor, okay, so anything I put here uh, doesn't show up. See, that's not being sent over, but over here, one plus one, that gives me a result. So the ARM chip is still running in the background. It's running the Python interpreter, even though this editor is running on the calculator side of things. Oh, but now I can double my productivity with a second keyboard. This should work. Seriously, I think this will work. Maybe? It does! <laughs> yes! All right, all right. Let's get, let's get, this is gonna be like the Matrix. Whoa, you mean like the Matrix? Yes, the Matrix. I am in a Matrix. Good for you. Uh, let's see. Five. Five times five. What? G. Uh, wait a minute. That's weird. It's trying to work, but it's not working. Escape works. I exited out to normal keyboard mode. Six. Well, now the keyboard's working properly. Uh, I wonder if Python is still running. Five times five. All right, Python is not running anymore. So the command from Putty fell on deaf circuits. And then if it was at a zoo, it would have fallen on deaf leopards. Oh. This is my entry for the cyber deck competition. What? Why am I getting all these weird things when I try to use a keyboard on Python? Is it not supported in Python, I wonder? The keyboard seems to be triggering functions. I'm getting, I'm getting major shades of the ZX spectrum here. This calculator will be putty in my hands. The power of putty in the palm of my hand. Is it sacrilege to say that I didn't think Spider-Man No Way Home was the greatest movie ever made. I mean, it was cool seeing Doc Ock fight Green Goblin, hashtag spoiler warning. You know what it reminded me of? It had basically the same plot as Wonder Woman 1984. It just wasn't executed terribly like Wonder Woman 1984. It's like, I wish I could have this thing. Oh, well, I will help you get your wish. Oh no, something went wrong. And apparently you could use a high school science lab to make an anti-molecular dissemination device. You can make a device that fixes electro and you can make a cure for the Green Goblin. You can do that all in a high school chemistry lab. That must be one well-funded school. I mean, the simplest thing that they built to fix the villains was a new inhibitor chip and they did that using the Stark fabrication machine. Okay, fine. But then the other stuff was way more complicated and those are the things they did in a high school lab. I mean, it should have been like the, uh, the, the, the Stark fabrication equipment has been destroyed. I missed the part where that's my problem. Well, what if we go to the lab and use some Arduinos to recreate the inhibitor chip? Because that inhibitor chip is older than an Arduino. I'm going to put some dirt in your eye. Okay, the lab assistant said we are producing a thousand megawatt surplus. Don't know why he didn't just say gigawatt. We are producing a 1,210 megawatt surplus. The power of Python in the palm of my hand. I do not know how to program in Python. I should learn. Although I have to admit, as someone who grew up in the 80s with basic, it seems kind of weird to use an interpreted language, but I know it's super popular. I mean, I know why TI still uses that descendant of the Z80, the Z80 Acclaim, which is a modern microcontroller. They use it because it can run all the old code, which they've been programming since, like, what, 1990? Python implementation seems pretty hacky. 
It's also seems pretty slow and I'm sure it's even slower if I really did a deep dive into it. I think if you would want to do something with Python, I would bet that the NumWorks calculator, I'm sure it does Python much better because I bet it's a, the whole thing is a 32-bit ARM implementation for both the calculator and Python. I think the real value with this, or maybe not the word value is the best word, the real cost with this is all of the decades now of curriculum designed around TI calculators. So that backwards compatibility is worth something at least to the education market. Are you gonna jump on that pinball machine? Don't do it. Oh, that's interesting. See how the calculator went into that kind of sleep mode, turned its screen dim. But sending the characters from the computer doesn't affect that. Yeah, so in REPL mode, the calculator itself is basically just acting like a, like a terminal. So with an FTDI cable and an AND gate, we were able to hook this thing up to PuTTY, which is kind of fun. Well, I hope you enjoyed taking a look inside of the new TI-84 Plus CE, oh man, that's quite the mouthful, Python edition calculator. Well, now I have two of these TI-84 Plus CEs. Uh, do you know a student in need who needs an extra calculator? I guess like, Leave a comment below or email me and I'll donate one of my extra calculators to them. All right, well, we'll see you in the next video.